everybody, welcome to the channel. It's your hosts, M and J. Hey guys. And today the two of us are going to be talking about episode 9 of She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. This episode opens on Catra with the Sword of Protection, and she's gloating to Shadow Weaver about how much better she is than her. And honestly, she has a point. Hordak and Shadow Weaver both had no idea that Catra and Scorpia went on this mission. That actually looks bad for Shadow Weaver because she's the one who's technically in charge and she just didn't know where they all went. Yeah, I mean, technically, if this was a real army, that would be considered insubordination, but it's the Horde, so... It doesn't really matter since Shadow Weaver is always going behind Hordak's back to try to get Adora, so at least when Catra does it, she's actually successful. Hordak contacts Shadow Weaver and congratulates her on a job well done because she's taking credit for Catra's work. He says that they're going to use Glimmer to get Queen Angela to hand herself over in exchange for her safe return, effectively ending the rebellion. Afterwards, Catra calls her out for lying to Hordak, but Shadow Weaver explains that's just the way it goes because Catra is under Shadow Weaver's authority and dismisses Catra. The shot then pans over to reveal that Glimmer is being held in that same room. Overall, I feel like Catra should have probably expected this by now, but she seems like she really has a lot of faith in Hordak. She's really happy to see him when he calls and honestly believes that she's probably gonna get promoted or something. But instead, she gets shut down by Shadow Weaver and Hordak gives Shadow Weaver all the credit. You would think this might be a wake-up call for her, that the Horde is not going to ever recognize her or respect her the way that she deserves because at this point, she is the only one that has succeeded. Adora's gone back to Bright Moon where she talks to Queen Anne Angela. She says she's going to accept the Horde's terms and surrender herself in exchange for Glimmer, even though that would mean the end of the rebellion. Adora says that's a bad idea because there's no way to know if the Horde would even keep up their end of the bargain. Angela says that a rescue attempt is too risky and it might have been possible if they still had She-Ra, but because the Sword of Protection is in the Horde's hands, that's not an option. But really, She-Ra is just a power-up for Adora. Adora is the one that has the knowledge that can be used to help with the rescue attempt because she knows the Horde and can infiltrate them just like she did in episode 4. Adora promises to return Glimmer and Bo and leaves concerned but determined. Meanwhile, Angela goes back to sulking. It's a little depressing that she doesn't do more to help in this situation, but I guess she is under a lot of stress. As Adora is walking down the hall getting more and more frustrated, she notices a lot of flowers floating around her and looks to see perfume on her Mista, Seahawk, and even Entrapta are sitting in the window. She asks what they're doing there, and they explain that as part of the Princess Alliance, they're there to rescue Glimmer and Bo. I'm glad to see these characters taking initiative and taking this alliance seriously, but I also really have to wonder where are Natasha and Spinnerella? I know that maybe it's kind of annoying to keep bringing them up, but they've been loyal to the Rebellion for way longer than any of these characters even. They show up every every week to the rebellion meetings. And they were also at the prom. They're completely aware of what happened and what the Horde did just as much as these characters are. This could have been a great chance to include them. I honestly don't understand why these two characters were even included in this season if they weren't going to be utilized. Just introduce them when you actually have something for them to do. It's kind of frustrating because a lot of the marketing for this show talked about how it was so much better than the original because they cared about diversity. They wanted to have this show live up to their standards of diversity and have all this representation. Yet these two characters represent multiple people groups but are not utilized at all. These characters are mostly regulated to background characters or maybe cameo appearances. It's actually disappointing because I would like to see more of them and what they could possibly add to the show but we really don't get to see that at all throughout this season. Even even when they have a great opportunity to include them, they're excluded. I mean, this is the Princess Alliance's first mission, so shouldn't the two characters who have been there from the beginning and have actively been trying to take a role in the Alliance be here? It's also disappointing that we don't get to see any of the aftermath of the Kingdom of Snows. The Kingdom of Snows is neutral, and the ball is neutral, and they were directly attacked by the Horde because their princess allowed them 
into the ball. I would imagine that the people of the Kingdom of Snows would not be happy. And Frosta was already really worried about the way that she was perceived by other people because she was a kid. So there's a lot of really interesting character conflict that we could have seen with Frosta. It also would have been nice to see her actually apologize to Adora, who had been constantly warning her throughout the prom that this was a bad idea, and also the threat of the Horde to begin with, only for Frosta to constantly shut her down and insist that she knew better. At this point, she should at least be declaring war on the Horde. She said that the Kingdom of Snows is able to defend itself, so they must have an army. And it would make sense for her to join the Princess Alliance, but maybe we could have seen her pride get a little bit in the way of that. But either way, she should probably be talking to Adora at least, especially since the whole world now knows that this whole thing happened because literally all of the princesses were there. It's disappointing to see all this potential not really be taken advantage of. It seems like there are a lot of interesting concepts that are introduced, but are ultimately just left as plot threads that are dangling there. So Adora demonstrates why Hordak really needs to care about the fact that there's a deserter in his ranks by going over the Horde's base and explaining all of the weak points they can abuse in order to break out Glimmer and Bo. I do like the leadership in this scene from Adora. This show hasn't really done a great job of showing strong leadership, so this scene is actually really refreshing. We see Adora using her knowledge of the Horde, and we see her taking into consideration her team's magical abilities and various strengths. She gives them each something to do in the plan, and it's nice to see this. The group goes to the Fright Zone and splits up so they can each take part in their part of the plan. Mermista enters the sewer system so she can infiltrate the building and unlock the doors. Meanwhile, Adora and Seahawk take care of the guards standing watch, and Entrapta and Perfuma manage to kill the lights. Although Entrapta does get pretty distracted with the Horde's technology, which seems to be pretty outdated and crummy. So I guess the Horde's technology isn't so great after all. Mermista ends up getting held up in the sewers, so while they're waiting for her, Seahawk gets caught by Scorpia. He manages to convince her that he's there to inspect their facilities, so she takes him off on her skiff. Although this could have been avoided if Adora and Seahawk had just put on the uniforms of those two guards they knocked out. Mermista's finally able to get the doors open, so the remaining princesses duck inside the building. However, Entrapta gets distracted again and wanders off so she can look at more of the Horde's tech. Meanwhile, Bo and Glimmer have been separated. Bo is being held in a cell, and one of Adora's old teammates, a boy named Kyle, brings him food. Bo tries to ask Kyle if he knows anything about Glimmer, like where she is and if she's okay. And Kyle refuses to tell him anything, but he is surprised that Bo is talking to him because no one usually talks to him. We haven't really talked about Adora's teammates because they haven't really played a huge role in the story until now. But Kyle is kind of the scrawny kid. He's not a very good fighter. He did do his part during the mission led by Catra in the last episode. So he was able to do things, but he's mostly the kid who falls over a lot. And they're usually just yelling at him. No one seems to take him seriously or put a lot of effort into training him. Kyle was on Adora's team and he must know that Bo is one of Adora's new friends. So I am kind of curious about what he thinks of all this. Maybe Bo talking to Kyle makes him think that Adora might have had a point to leave. I am kind of curious about how the rest of her team feels about Adora leaving the Horde. We get a lot from Catra, but not really a lot from anybody else outside of Shadow Weaver. Glimmer's being held in the Black Garnet chamber, and she's being restrained by the Black Garnet's magic. Shadow Weaver explains that she's going to exchange Glimmer for her mother so they can basically crush the rebellion then and there. Honestly, this whole thing was Glimmer's fault. If she had just stuck to the plan of watching Scorpia, none of this would have happened. Scorpia wasn't even being discreet when she was planting those bombs around the palace. But instead, she just had to guilt trip Bo at that very moment when she was most needed. Hasn't she been pretty adamant about the rebellion and proving to her mother that she was a good leader only to mess up this badly and get herself and Bo captured? Not to mention getting the kingdom 
Kingdom of Snow is attacked. We really need to feel for Glimmer in this scene, but I just can't help but remember that this is all her fault. It's sad that this whole thing came at the cost of her character. She was already being pretty terrible in the past three episodes, and this just kind of cemented the fact that she's in over her head and really shouldn't be in a position of leadership. It would have looked better if they'd had a way to have Scorpio outsmart her or something along those lines. Maybe a team effort between Scorpio, Catra, Lonnie, and Kyle. But instead they had Glimmer be completely unreasonable with the way she was stalking Bo. So it just made her look pretty bad. Adora's able to find Bo's cell, but she sees that Glimmer isn't being held with him. So she concludes that she must be being held somewhere else. An enemy robot shows up, but it turns out and trapped or reprogrammed it to be her friend. She's calling it Emily now, and she also managed to save Seahawk from Scorpia, who was having trouble keeping up the inspector disguise. They decide to break Bo out, and then they'll all figure out where Glimmer is. And Trapta and Mermista stay back to work the controls while the others go to free Bo, but they end up running into Lonnie, another one of Adora's former teammates when she was with the Horde. Lonnie does seem to be really upset to see Adora. She says she has a lot of nerve coming back here, but Adora insists that she has to save her friends. But Lonnie retorts that they used to be her friends. It would have really been interesting to see this explored more and to see the effect of Adora leaving on the rest of her team. But we really don't see anything outside of Catra. The one time Lonnie mentioned Adora after she left was when she told Catra to watch out because Adora wasn't there to protect her anymore. But we never saw her actually missing Adora. That's something we were kind of saying earlier with Kyle. It would have been nice to actually see him mention Adora because they've actually shown that they did miss her. They've been on the same team probably their whole lives, but it was never actually shown. It's another one of those issues with show don't tell. We're told that they had a relationship, but we didn't actually get to see it. She says they were friends, but we never really saw them actually hanging out or being friends. We really only saw them doing that training exercise together back in the first episode. And that was the only time we ever saw them interacting. The show is often praised for how it portrays interpersonal relationships, but honestly, there was a lot more potential here that really isn't being utilized. I do like the teamwork between the Princess Alliance in this scene, including Mermista and Entrapta. They work really well together when they're on the same page. So if they could iron out those wrinkles, this whole thing could work, especially since they're up against the Horde. Kyle ends up going back to Bo and telling him that Glimmer is being held in the Black Garnet Chamber. Bo asks why he would tell him that, and Kyle says that no one's ever been nice to him before. He ends up telling him how people in the Horde don't think he can do anything right. And yes, Kyle isn't great at fighting, but he did play his part during the attack on the princess prom. So it's not like he's a total screw up. But after Kyle tells Bo about Glimmer, Bo stops listening to him. Basically, he's heard everything he wanted to hear and now he just doesn't care. Kyle is no longer useful to Bo, so he just tunes him out. Bo, Kyle is taking a huge risk for you. He just betrayed the Horde by giving you this very important information. I understand that maybe it's kind of hard to listen to a person open up like that, but you could be a little more grateful. Bo sees that his friends are trying to stage a rescue, so he distracts Kyle by getting him to keep talking. Kyle says he was really moved by Bo's concern for his friends friend and was hoping that if he helped, they could be friends too. Bo agrees to this without really thinking about what he's saying. He's just trying to distract Kyle. But then Seahawk picks him up and throws him. So I guess that's the end of that. They rescue Bo and he tells them that Glimmer is being held in the Black Garnet Chamber, but he doesn't tell them that he got that information from Kyle. I am very disappointed, Bo. Yeah, Bo agreed to be friends with him, so now that's his responsibility. Kyle clearly doesn't want to stay with the Horde. Kyle doesn't actually have anything to worry about. The Horde doesn't care about deserters, so all he needs is a place to go. And if Bo was able to train that kitchen staff to be fighters, he could probably figure something out for Kyle. Bo's probably a better trainer than Shadow Weaver is. Maybe Kyle just needs a different approach. This next part is kind of confusing, and we had to watch this scene a few times. But they get to this hallway that turns out to not actually be a hallway. A 
apparently it's a vent system, but it's huge. And it has these chambers where these doors open and close, but when the doors close, everything inside the chamber burns. I don't really understand why the horde has this. Seems kind of like a safety hazard. But Adora says they can go through this vent system to get to the hangars where the skiffs are, and they can use that to escape. But they have to keep moving and move quickly because if the door closes on them, they'll get trapped inside. She ends up staying behind so she can go look for Glimmer. Bo tries to say that she should come with them, but she closes the door on him, which I would think would be kind of dangerous. Perfuma has to pull him through before the doors close and the chamber burns. Adora surrenders herself to the soldiers so she can be taken to Shadow Weaver and, by extension, Glimmer. When Adora arrives, Shadow Weaver immediately demotes Catra and tells her to take her things out of the Force Captain barracks. So ironically, when Catra fails, she gets promoted, and when she succeeds, she gets demoted? Yeah, okay. But now that Shadow Weaver has Adora back, she basically never wants to see Catra again. Catra reluctantly leaves, but you can tell that she's basically fed up. I think it would have been interesting if they had a scene where Glimmer was trying to reach out to Catra and get her to join them the way Adora did. Although it probably wouldn't fit with the series considering the fact fact that Glimmer probably has no idea who Catra is outside of just being another Horde Force captain, but Adora never bothered to tell her about the relationship she has with Catra. But that would have been pretty interesting if they had chosen to go down that route. It could have led to some meaningful interactions and kind of helped Glimmer and Catra start to understand each other a little better. And there's a lot of opportunity here because there's a pretty big cast. It would have been interesting to see people bounce off of each other in ways that they just didn't show. Adora offers to stay as long as Shadow Weaver lets Glimmer go, but Shadow Weaver has her own plans. She decides to brainwash Adora and erase her memories of her time with the Rebellion and She-Ra. Shadow Weaver begins brainwashing Adora, and Glimmer's finally able to break out of the restraints. I guess she just needed the proper motivation. She takes out Shadow Weaver with one punch, which is a little disappointing on Shadow Weaver's part. But she gets Adora out of her restraints, and it turns out Adora's okay. The rest of the Princess Alliance is finally making their way out of that weird vent system. It kind of just feels like another obstacle for them to get through. But as they're all making their way out, and trapped as robot Emily gets stuck in a USB port and isn't able to follow them out, and Trapta ends up going back for her, but she can't get her out in time. So the door closes and the room burns. Everyone's obviously horrified by this, although she's probably okay. After all, she still needs to join the Horde. Adora and Glimmer are trying to escape, and Glimmer tries to teleport the two of them, but she's not able to teleport, probably because of the effects of the Black Garnet. Catra ends up catching up to them, and she has the Sword of Protection, but she hands it over to Adora. Letting them escape with the Sword of Protection would be the best revenge for Catra after Shadow Weaver stabbed her in the back. Catra leaves while Adora transforms into She-Ra. She and Glimmer run to meet with the others outside, and in this scene, She-Ra is not carrying the Sword of Protection. After this whole episode of her not having it and it being so important and them really needing to get it back, the animators just forgot to put it in. It's really sloppy, especially for such an important moment. They do make it onto the skiff with the others, and they're about to celebrate when they realize that Entrapta is missing. The others explain that Entrapta didn't make it, so She-Ra transforms back into Adora. Overall in this episode, we did like a lot of the individual elements. It was really great to see Adora's leadership and to see these characters working together when they were on the same page. But there's also a lot of missed opportunities. It's a real shame that Natas and Spinarella are excluded. They really deserve to
to be here. Honestly, they kind of deserved their own episode. Maybe instead of the Mysticore episode, we could have had a Natasha and Spinarella episode. Yeah, that Mysticore episode just kind of didn't really need to be there. They didn't even recruit a princess or anything. I liked the little confrontation between Lonnie and Adora, where Lonnie was saying that they used to be friends, but we haven't seen them be friends. We haven't seen them hanging out or asking about each other. It was kind of just dropped. So it's like they're telling us things, but they're not showing us, and they expect that that's enough. I think that's a problem that this series suffers from. And the truth is, there is a lot of time that isn't spent in a productive way. There's a lot of time wasted on jokes and on filler. And there are jokes that are stretched out longer than they really need to be, even in this episode. The stuff with Seahawk pretending to be an inspector could have been cut down a little bit. Also, at the beginning, when they're going over their plan, there's a lot of bickering over who's going to be represented by what item. I guess it's in character, but it also ended up being a lot of padding. I think this episode had a good plot, but it's sad that it had to come at the expense of Glimmer's character. Glimmer has just been awful these past three episodes. This whole episode really hinges on feeling for her, and she's the one who caused this whole mess. She's the reason that she and Bo were captured in the first place, and the reason they lost the Sword of Protection. She's the reason that they lost in Trapta. Then there was this strange hallway ventilation system that didn't make any sense. Why does it have these chambers that need to be purged? What's the point of this? And then Emily got stuck in a USB port. How does that happen? It seemed more like just an extra obstacle for them to overcome in order to raise the stakes. But that was our opinion on the episode. What did you guys think? We'd really appreciate your comments. And remember to like and subscribe if you want to see more of our content. We'd really appreciate it, and thank you so much for watching this video. We'll see you in the next one. Bye, everyone. Bye.